scripture simply of the temple. And we'll be talking about the temple and what was going on there in John, but I'd really like to lay some groundwork for all of Lent. I wasn't here for Ash Wednesday, and, and I don't apologize for that, but for me, the time of Lent, those 40 days minus the Sundays, this journey not only toward or to Easter or to the cross, which is the central symbol for us as Christians. And there's a particular verse in, in the Bible that's like one of those John 3 16s that I feel like as Christians that we should know. And it's literally 1 Corinthians 1st chapter and the 18th verse, which says the cross to all the world is foolish, but to those who believe. It's life eternal. It's the one symbol, it's the one item that's in the temple, in the worship center. It's the one item that says to us, as Christians, as those who believe that through this we have been given not also a pardon for our sin, but also life eternal. And, and that's what makes it different. That's what makes our religion completely different from any other religion. That it's not anything other than God's gift, God's willingness. And today as we turn now into John, into the second chapter, and let me help you get where we are here. And John is not one of the synoptic gospels, not part of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who work all intertwined together, but Mark sets apart. I mean, John sets apart, and, and quite often, John is kind of like saying, uh, after everything else had been written, John's saying, wait a second. Wait a second, this is what's most important. And John, being the one whom we call the revelator, points out for us what John believes that we need to see uh, very, very blatantly that the divinity of Jesus, the divinity of Christ that is alive in Jesus and reveals to us. So it's John who takes this story, all the gospel writers, write about the cleansing of the temple. But it's John who doesn't put it over in Holy Week, who doesn't put it over in those last, very last days, but rather John puts it up front in his gospel. He puts it up there right behind this, another very familiar story in the beginning of John 2 is the wedding at Cana. It's to where, you know, John shares with us this story where Jesus turns the water into wine. This miraculous sign of taking the water that was the water of ritual rites and turning it into wine, and not merely just turning it into wine, but the best wine that Jesus proved there in his first act after his mother's encouragement that he does have miraculous signs and abilities. So, so listen now at verse 13 in the second chapter of John. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins, overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. And he said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, Passion for your house consumes me. 
Then the Jewish leaders asked Jesus, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple. In three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God add for us now not only this reading and hearing, but also some understanding of this. It's the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Pray with me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, for you are the potter, and I am the clay. Amen. It was one day, Mom was in the kitchen, and, and she began her normal routine of getting breakfast together and she took the butter and she began to put it on the toast and well you know inevitably occasionally this happened the uh, the toast flipped out of her hand and it landed on the floor but this time it was butter up <laughs> Murphy's Law says right chef mm -hmm. Murphy's Law says if it can go wrong, it will. And then every time a buttered piece of toast hits the floor, it's always buttered down. <laughs> Meaning you can't quickly salvage it without it picking up something you don't want off the floor. But this time, all of a sudden, and she said, oh my, Murphy's Law is wrong. And she begins to say this, so they call on the scientists, and they call in this, and they put up a a no pass through zone, so forth, and they get all the analysis and everything, so forth, and they come in and they recreate the thing and all that they're trying to say that Murphy's Law is wrong. Well, but finally they were able to come to a conclusion. The problem wasn't Murphy's Law was wrong. The problem was the fact that mom had buttered the bread on the wrong side. <laughs> <coughs> the cross. The symbol. To the whole entire world, they knew what the cross was. It, it was a place of crucifixion. It was an instrument of death. And it was a place where Jesus, outside of the city, not in the building, not in the synagogue, not in the temple, but outside of the city on a hill called Golgotha. It was a place where Jesus chose to do things in a way, well, that seemed to be wrong. If he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, why would he possibly uh, allow this to happen and to go through with this? And then to be taken down and, and to put in a grave where people come and cry and weep and so forth. But still yet, we see it different. We see it different. We see it from the other side because for us the grave we know could not contain him. Year after year after year, we come back to this point of Lent as to where we begin this journey of working our way and working our way just gradually. Although corporate, as all Christian believers and, and all of this faith community, as we work through this, but more or less, Lent is kind of an individual a selfie. <coughs> We will apologize for using that word, but a selfie is we look at ourselves and inside of ourselves, and we begin to say is, what do we need to do differently? What is it that's prevented me from truly being able to see that I need a cleansing? 
that, that I need to allow this Spirit of God to come in and to drive out the things that don't need to be there that's hampering or preventing me from being able to trust, from being able to believe. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, you're going to hear the word believe again and again and again from here through Easter and after. Because without believing, without the simple believing and trusting in God, we don't understand. 